Hello, good evening and guten Abend, everybody. Um, my name is Inga. I'm a member of Glasgow Loves You, and it is my huge pleasure to welcome you to this lockdown live stream. Um, tonight, we've got the honor of chatting to Helga Novotny, who is live with us. Helga Novotny is uh, a previous president of the European Research Council. She is an esteemed and much lauded researcher. Um, we'll be talking a little bit about um, the ERC, about how Brexit has impacted it, and also about issues around uncertainty, which is uh, one of Helga's specialist subjects. But before we start chatting, I just wanted to say that she also has a book out. It's called In AI We Trust. It's just been published by Polity. And Helga, you just told us that that book has also been impacted by Brexit. Absolutely. I did not expect it. So good evening, everyone. I had not expected it at all, <clears throat> because as you know, uh, in the EU, there is nothing like paying duty anymore if you buy something from, from abroad. So I was very surprised when the publisher sent me an advanced copy. And as I happened to be in Italy uh, during the summer, one copy was sent to Italy and one copy here to my office in Vienna. And in Italy, I had to pay three euros 20 and in Vienna, five euros 70. And, you know, it's a mystery to me why the difference. And uh, you can say, well, it's not much money, but, uh, you know, it, the symbolic value was uh, very, very strong. And it really uh, brought back to me what I call really the tragedy of Brexit. Yeah, and the fact that it's different in every country is now, I think, one of the, the interesting impacts that I see because there are no more rules and we've sort of we've fallen out of all of these agreements. And so now people can just basically make it up as they go along and put whatever price they want on parcels. So that's oh, quite stressful. So, <laughs> but yes, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about um, the European Research Council. So you were <laughs> its first president. For people who do not know, um, the European Research Council is the most prestigious uh, research funding organization uh, funded by the EU. Um, it uh, awards high, uh, call it uh, sort of um, highly, uh, highly competitive grants to researchers. Um, there's fundamental research. Yes, for fundamental research. So that really is basic blue skies research um, where people are really trying to push frontiers of our knowledge. So, um, and in the sort of decade and a half that it's existed, it has become one of the most esteemed funding agencies in the world. So it does compete, you know, very competitive, um, comparable to, to similar organizations in the United States. And people can come from all over, they get a grant and they can choose whichever European research institute they want to be at so the grants are transportable which I think is a really important um, aspect of the whole organization so um, as someone who's you know previous president and a close observer can you tell us a little bit about how Brexit has impacted the ERC and its work? Well it, it means de facto that um, um, researchers from the UK are no longer eligible for uh, the grants since everything has been signed. There was a transition period, but now it's definitely over. And the British government, um, you know, promises it will step in for funding. But I think uh, researchers in the UK have all reason to doubt how long it will last. But you also lose um, the a bit of the of the prestige that comes from being really international because the juries the panels that uh, select the ESC grantees are really of the highest uh, international level and uh, we have been able to gain the trust of researchers from early on and so it means uh, the UK, you, you are back to being judged by uh, people from, from the UK only. And uh, this means also a decrease in, in the prestige it brings with it. This is the way how science works for those of you who are not uh, in, in, in science. And um, so it's, it's very regrettable, uh, especially with regard to the ESC, because um, the UK was immensely successful. And <clears throat> this means not only money-wise, it's always good if you, uh, you know, have uh, high 
um, grants that, that bring in a lot of money, but also in terms of prestige. And um, as you know, also, there are a high number of people from uh, continental Europe who were working in the UK. So it, you know, it made a very lively and um, cosmopolitan international research environment, uh, which benefited everyone. And <clears throat> as you could see, I mean, also I have friends who uh, after Brexit, you know, were looking how to come back to Europe. Um, there are not many people who now want to go to the UK and work there because of the uncertainty, because you don't know how funding will develop in the future, uh, let alone of, you know, student numbers and universities that act as cash cows and uh, wait for Chinese and other students to come that no longer come now due to the pandemic, but, you know, it, it all adds up and so definitely the, the UK research system is a big loser, but of course, so is Europe because um, it's always put in a competition if you have good people to compete with because it raises the standards. So from this point of view, it's uh, like a, a Formula One race, you know, if you have some of the best drivers who no longer compete in it, you know, the, the, the race itself suffers also from, uh, from, from the fact that the best drivers are no longer there. So it's, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a real tragedy in my view. And, but now that's how it is. And um, yeah, uh, researchers in the UK are in for a hard time. I'm, I'm afraid. Yeah. I'm afraid so too, even though our politicians have often proclaimed that, you know, since we have the best drivers, so to speak, uh, if you want to compare, you know, the Formula One to, to research, you know, if we then go global, we can compete, you know, even better and with even more people and, you know, with the UK having, you know, Cambridge and, and Oxford and some of the best universities in the world, it won't be a problem. But do you think that's actually true that we sort of just become even more competitive by no, detaching from you know I, I i would not worry about uh, oxford and cambridge or the russell group yeah because also i think every uk government has known how to ring fence uh, the, the top universities but if you just go a little bit outside the russell group universities you had some very good universities and they are bound to, to, to suffer. Because if you no longer have research grants that are available, you know, uh, there is, it's, it's not an attractive environment anymore. And um, so, and, and, you know, the globe is, is, uh, is a big place and I don't see how uh, it will make up and um, also, even if you look, I mean, the situation in, in the US is very different. Now you have this tension with US-China, uh, which makes it difficult to cooperate with research groups in, in, in China, et cetera. So, um, you know, it um, it's, can be a very lonely place uh, if you go out uh, and think that you find your, um, your competitors in, on, in, in research um, around the world and you will not find many while with with Europe it was really um, a, a wonderful way how the best of Britain and uh, the research system was brought into the ESC was brought into the European research system and now um, yeah unfortunately this time is over. Yes. So you touched on an interesting issue there, actually, because, um, you know, saying that if, if you look outside Oxford, Cambridge and the Russell Group, you see the, the, the second tier universities. And the UK, I think, generally has this problem that there are some very concentrated wealthy areas like London and the southeast. And then you have the, you know, very deprived areas in the north. And um, so British society in general is, is incredibly divided between classes, the working class and the middle class, between regions, the north and the south. And now, on top of this, we have this Brexit divide between the Remainers and the Leavers. And um, as someone who has researched societies and uncertainty, um, I was wondering if you can kind of, you know, if you agree with, with, with me that there is this 
huge divide and if you would maybe be aware of any historical parallels to a society that has suddenly been confronted with this huge yes no choice and now finds itself kind of split down the middle well i i find it difficult to find historical precedents you know if i think of um i mean if you think the austro-hungarian empire after the first world war you know was dissolved i mean it, it collapsed and then you had different nation states and this was considered a, a terrible loss um, uh, i mean countries tried of course uh, to to enjoy their independence but the time after the war was economically very very difficult and and we know where it led to it it led in the end to the rise of of uh, nazi germany and and fascism and um, so, um, but, um, you know, it was not one, uh, one country. Uh, so Britain left a political union that uh, it voluntarily entered and there were conditions, rights and duties and what you had to pay and what you got uh, back, is, et cetera. So it was leaving um, a, more a, a union uh, association. Um, and so from this point of view, I, I don't find many, many or any historical precedents. And also it's not one country where one region splits away. You know, it's not a secession in, in that sense because it was not a nation state. But, um, but still, you know, I, I was thinking um, the, the channel that separates the continent and uh, the island that is the UK, you know, there was Doggerland thousands of years ago, which means uh, there was land between, which then was flooded and it's still there. I don't know how many, you know, miles or kilometers below the channel now, but it's still there and it's called Doggerland. So, you know, something like this <laughs> may be a symbol of, of what happened. Now you have this channel in between, but there's still some connection un un underneath. And so from this point of view, um, I, I really hope that the young generation, um, also with uh, the help of, uh, I mean, we have new technologies, uh, travel, once the pandemic is over, will resume even if in a different form. Uh, I, I really hope that the new generation will come open-minded and they will um, find new kinds of relationships that have to be built up again. Mm -hmm. Okay, lovely. I want to talk a little bit more um, to you about uncertainty, but before then, um, I just wanted to say if people have questions, please post them on Twitter or on Facebook under this live stream. Um, and I believe we have a question from the audience. So, um, Jenny, it's over to you. Sure, yeah. Um, so we have a question in from Stuart and he's asking, how can we in Scotland maintain our links with the European Research and Development Centres? Well, um, I mean, science is um, international and has always been international. But um, of course, you need in these days, you need also funding agencies um, to, to go along and to fund cooperation. And I remember before the Brexit, there were a number of delegations coming from the UK trying to, they were visiting universities, they were visiting funding agencies to try to build up some kind of links. But in the end, this came to nothing. So I would say, you know, uh, go on, have um, cooperation whenever you can find them, to research groups. Um, there is a lot of sympathy among uh, researchers in, in Europe, uh, you know, to, to welcome you with open arms. But of course, in the end, it also depends on uh, funding agencies that must put aside some funds in order to enable these corporations. But if, just as we have corporations also with, um, you know, the so-called third countries in the, in the um, language of the, of, of the European Commission, um, you know, there are possibilities. And, and I would say, you know, be open and um, 
remain in touch and to build up new links. Thank you. Um, so, you know, Bre Brexit, um, like I said before, it has created a huge amount of uncertainty all over the UK, especially now in Scotland, because Scotland voted to remain and now finds itself in a situation yeah. where a Scottish independence referendum has become once again um, a serious matter, matter that is being discussed. Um, but I was wondering a little bit more general um, on the basis of, of your research. Um, so how do societies sort of deal with you know, uncertainty or these sort of huge seismic events? And have you seen any typical developments in the UK um, around that? Well, I think what was um, interesting and unexpected was, of course, the coincidence, the temporal overlap, the consequences of Brexit and the consequences of the pandemic. Mm. This nobody could foresee that this would uh, happen uh, within the same period of time. And this is, you know, confounding. It's, it's, it's difficult to take apart what of the shortages that you see, uh, you know, the truck drivers that are missing, uh, supply chains that are interrupted, all the images we, we get um, on television, and I'm sure you also uh, must, uh, must see. You know, it's, it's difficult to, uh, to, to take it apart because it's a consequence and overlap of both. Um, you know, people had to go home or they wanted to go home because of um, the, the pandemic. And then, you know, they hesitate to come back. So there is this, um, this, this overlap, which um, makes it difficult really to separate what is due to, uh, to, uh, to Brexit and uh, to analyze the consequences. But the result, of course, is the situation is um, becoming um, a bit uncomfortable um, because you see no kinds of um, developments and consequences that nobody thought of. And it's interesting that, you know, the people dealing with risk and un uncertainty, there have always been uh, models and um, people trying to analyze decision, what is called decision-making under uncertainty. But now they came up with a new concept and it's called decision-making under unawareness. And they define it as um, this arises when decision-making cannot even conceive of the contingencies that uh, affect the outcomes of their decisions. And I think what happened with the benefit of hindsight with the Brexit vote was probably for many people decision-making um, under conditions of unawareness. Mm -hmm. So nobody could think through what are the contingencies. And now we see some of the contingencies that, that are happening and that are uh, exacerbated by, by, the, by the pandemic. Yes. So that's, um, you know, we, we always um, know that plans and human intentions are one thing, and then you have always the unintended consequences of, of human action, and the future is inherently uncertain. But, um, you know, I find it interesting that people start to think uh, decision making under under unawareness. <laughs> yeah, that's I mean, I think anyone who's monitored the British government's action over the past five years will know that there is a lot of unawareness <laughs> going on and you can quite often read it on their faces. Hmm. Well, um, I'd love to talk a little bit more about um, sort of, you know, the, the idea of the future always being uncertain and, and how that relates to Brexit. But before we do that, um, I'm going to come back to Jenny because there's another question. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so uh, there's another question uh, from Stuart. So he says that you've been famous for saying that politics should not impose its values on science. So what do you think of the British government's policies towards COVID? <laughs> well... <laughs> I, I don't think I can say very much uh, about it because, um, you know, all governments had, had to struggle with, uh, with, with COVID. And you could see that there were certain phases and uh, depending very much at which phase you are looking at it, 
um, information that was available, information that was not available, data that were there, that were not there. In any case, you know, it was too, too easy for the British government in the beginning to say, we followed the science, you know, because the science can only speak about probabilities. The science depends on the knowledge and we have learned so much more than we knew at the beginning. You know, if you uh, think in, 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 in the beginning, people were told um, to disinfect every surface, uh, they would touch the, the knobs of the doors, etc. And, and now we know it's, it's aerosols that are the main transmitters and that we have to make sure that um, we open our windows and we have adequate ventilation, et cetera, et cetera. So, so we have learned much more about it. But, um, you know, in, in the end, um, regarding the measures to be taken, it's the politicians who have to take the measures. And here, perhaps this um, question of uncertainty comes in again. Because um, for scientists, um, dealing with uncertainty is something they do all the time. Uh, and sometimes it's called probabilities. And sometimes, you know, it's the uncertainty is also um, exciting because it's new knowledge that you want to gain. Um, while for politicians, they want to have certainty and they want to have answers by scientists. Uh, tell me yes or no. And uh, scientists, if they are honest, and I think they are honest in, in their answers, have to say under the condition X, you know, um, you will have uh, with so and so much probability um, the effect Y. But this is nothing that a politician is happy to hear. Sadly, uh, yes. Um... We've got questions coming in hard and fast now. So I've got one more, Delhi. Yeah, sure. So we have a question in from Delia. Um, are you worried about the threat of Brexit for the union with other countries thinking of exiting? So seeing demonstrations in Poland and also Hungary and Czech Republic and Spain. So do you think perhaps a European identity is getting more and more difficult to sustain? I, I would um, um, answer with, in, in it in a twofold way um, when the, the the countries or I would say certain politicians in some of the countries could see you know this long drawn out painful period of negotiating the the, the brexit you know the the this much of documents, stacks, and more that nobody was able to read, digest, etc. Uh, people forgot uh, any uh, wish they had to leave the EU. So it had the opposite effect. And Poland and Hungary are different uh, cases. Um, I think for the for the Czech Republic, you know, it's now uh, the opposition won the latest elections. Uh, it's just the president does not want to go, um, and the, the it will be solved. Uh, I'm I'm sure in a democratic way. For Poland, it's different because they are really playing with. Um, uh, trying to uh, get all the money, the funds from the EU, but not uh, wanting to accept EU law, which is unacceptable. On the other hand, if you saw these thousands, ten thousands of people protesting in Warsaw and in, in the large cities just last weekend, you know, the Poles don't want to leave. It's certain politicians. And it's this double play, um, also, also Orban, you know, they accept funds, uh, very often also giving it to their cronies. And, uh, you know, the funds are um, not for, used for the purpose for which uh, they are, are given. And uh, on the other hand, uh, trying to whip up sentiment against uh, the EU. So it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a nasty situation, but I would say overall, um, it, it was uh, counterproductive. No country really, citizens did not want to go through the same painful process as you had to. <laughs> 
and uh, smart they are. I mean, it, I think that's one of the, like it's, a, it's a very big and sad problem that the UK had was that I think there was a silent majority who was for Remain, but a lot of people just didn't bother to vote. A lot of people who lived abroad didn't vote. A lot of younger people didn't mm -hmm. vote just because they weren't really that, um, they weren't really that passionate about it. Whereas the, the Leave side, you know, was very, very vocal and very, very good at getting the message across that there would be some sort of benefit from this that was never explained or never, you know, defined. But so that led to the to the scary situation where everybody could imagine their own benefit and <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, it was fantasy or it was, hype or or wrong uh, information or yeah. promises that were never uh, realistic and you could yeah. not expect them to be fin to be fulfilled. Yes. And so we talked a bit about the uncertain future. And um, I think from having campaigned uh, for Remain and, you know, everyone in this group would probably agree that many, many of the people who supported Brexit and voted to leave were yearning for some kind of past where life was simpler and things were more stable and there was more certainty and, and British people knew who they were and there were someone important. They weren't just a partner of many, but, you know, there'd, there'd be some, there'd sort of like, and I think people were hoping to go back to the situation where there was just certainty about where things are going. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering um, if you had any advice on how, you know, we as a society can make uncertainty work for people who are quite worried about it. <laughs> well, you know, I, I think it is important not just to look to the past, but also to the future. And um, the future is never a repetition of, of the past. And um, so, but I think also in, in the current situation, um, people are discovering that things can be otherwise. I mean, if you find out that um, you have difficulties in, uh, with your supply chains, you know, people are resourceful after all. So they try to make up, they find new ways. And some of the new ways they find may be offering something that they did not see. And again, it was a bit like during the pandemic, you know, when, when we discovered uh, you don't have to take Ryanair or, or EasyJet, you know, just to leave the country for a weekend. You know, there are other things that you can do on a weekend that are... Uh, more climate uh, friendly, but also quite quite pleasant. So you know we are discovering um, in situations where the normal expectations are not fulfilled that there are other ways of living, um, and of course there must be sufficient people who are able to do that. You need a certain basic um, also social economic security to, to start out with, uh, certainly. But otherwise, you know, people are, di are discovering that it can be otherwise. And I think this is one of the positive um, effects of uncertainty. And then um, if you're curious, you want to know more, you start to explore and you find new things and new perspectives uh, to it. So, you know, let, uh, let the past be the past. You can look at it on television if you look at historic movies or Abbey, Downtown Abbey, whatever, you know, Netflix series can conjure the past, look at it as something that is in the realm of history or fiction or fictional history, whatever you like. It's um, good for your imagination, but let it uh, remain the past and look towards the future. And the future has challenges, but the future is also something that uh, for, for young people remains the attractive part of their life because it's the life they have in front of them. Yes, indeed. So um, thank you very much. That's, that's a very positive thing to take away maybe from this chat. If people have any more questions, please post them uh, in the chat because we've got time for a few more. Um, I might ask you a little bit controversially then, have you seen any positive outcomes of Brexit? <laughs> either on research or more general <laughs> no in in the field of research definitely not no. not um i i must say um it's not even 
you know, maybe people who left the UK, Europeans who came back to Europe, they usually bring something back, which I would call the best of um, British research culture, you know. And um, so we are, we are profiting of that um, because it's something the way how, um, you know, to, to raise quality in research is of course something that had to be done, that needs to be done. And uh, there, there were, not everything was done in, in, a, in a good way, but some parts of it were done in a, in a good way. And so, but otherwise I, I don't see any, any advantages in research uh, at all. Um, and uh, I can only say, you know, Europe is open for British researchers if you want to come. <laughs> <laughs> we'll stop posting them. There's too many of them leaving. <laughs> and I think in, in France, there was even a kind of initiative, you know, to lure some of the British researchers. Oh, yes. The Germany, I remember, did the same thing where they have this lovely video like, we have great kindergartens and beautiful forests and, you know, in your family. Yeah. We were so <laughs> So, um, yeah, I think, um, you know, honestly, that all that talk about, you know, Britain now finally pulling its weight on the global stage, it will be mostly in terms of people going elsewhere. <laughs> Sadly. Um, and, and otherwise, you know, I, I think, um, I don't know what will happen uh, looking at this sort of un, un, undeclared, um, it's, it's, it's not a war, luckily, but, uh, you know, the fights between British and French fishermen. <clears throat> yeah? uh, what does it mean in terms of eating fish, uh, buying fish uh, or, or mussels or scallops, whatever? Um, but uh, it's, it's an absurdity, of course. Yeah. It is. Um, I've got a question uh, from, from Denny. So, Denny, fire away. Yeah, so just getting back to your uh, book there, um, I've actually just finished reading Weapons of Mass Destruction by Cathy O'Neill. You've probably read it, and I'm yeah. sure everyone has seen Coded Bias on Netflix. So I'm just wondering, what is your opinion of the UK's potential divergence from GDPR? Look, it's one of the many ways in which um, the UK wants to get away from uh, European regulations. And you can see it in, in many fields um, because uh, it's supposed to be free market, uh, you know, economic freedom, liberty, neoliberalism, um, et cetera. So um, I think you are moving more towards uh, the, the US model, which gives a lot of power. I mean, we all are in the thrall of power of the large corporations, as we know, we use Google, we give our data to uh, the big corporations uh, just for the sake of convenience as also, um, Subof has written in the um, um, surveillance capitalism, the book. Um, yeah, so we do that, and and I think uh, the, the 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 data protection uh, regulation was one way. It's not perfect, but one way of saying, you know, in Europe at least, you know, we have certain standards, and now there's another regulation that is in preparation what to do with face recognition, et cetera, and it's a risk model based. So you're moving towards the, the US, but it's interesting enough, there is now a discussion in, in the US that was started in the science advisor's office. Um, we need a bill of rights for AI and our data, you know, just as um, when the US was founded seceding from Britain in um, the, the, the beginning of, of, of the US, the Bill of Rights meant protection against being um, arbitrarily uh, under, under the power of, um, of, of the political power of the day. And uh, now the idea is we need a bill of rights that regulate what are the rights of citizens regarding their data. So 
you know, but until this will be some kind of legislation and given the present uh, also um, difficulties that the Biden administration has to pursue any leg legislation, you know, who knows whether it will be passed and, and so on. So, but I see Britain shifting to the other side of the Atlantic. Thank you. Um, I wanted to bring the conversation back to Scotland a little bit. Um, so obviously Scotland voted largely to remain. People keep saying it's, it's a remain country. I mean, a third of people still voted to leave. So let's not forget that. No, but but, um, two thirds is a lot. Two thirds is a lot, exactly. And um, so Nicola Sturgeon has said that, um, you know, if, if there is a referendum and Scotland uh, does decide to succeed from the United Kingdom, then mm -hmm. we would automatically rejoin the EU. And that's not, that's not even going to be a referendum. It's just part of it's mm -hmm. part and parcel of that decision. Um, but I was wondering, as, as an expert in, in EU institutions and someone who, who has led, uh, you know, a very prestigious EU institution, is it really going to be that easy? Are they just going to let us back in? And, and, and then what would Scotland contribute as well to the EU? No, uh, because, um, you know, under the, um, the present rules, accession to the EU is a long process. Mm -hmm. You know, it does not happen overnight when you say, um, I want to join and uh, everyone says, wonderful, you know, tomorrow you are in. Uh, it would certainly be faster than uh, countries in the southeastern part of Europe, you know, that uh, for, for years and years are now waiting because there is a, a fatigue and uh, mistrust. I mean, who wants to have um, <clears throat> Serbia uh, in, uh, who wants to have Macedonia in, Albania in, etc.? On the other hand, um, you know, they would like, or some, some of them would like to, to be in. So it would certainly be faster, but still it's a long process. So if you want to, to join, um, you know, it, uh, it, it, it takes uh, a couple of years until it can actually happen. But, you know, once you are in, <clears throat> you are part of the <clears throat> decision making that is difficult uh, enough. But uh, if, if you look towards Norway, and sometimes, you know, this has come up in the, in, in the discussion, the Norwegians still sit on their oil. And so from an economic point of view, they, uh, as, as you know, in, there were two referendum and they said, no, we don't want uh, to join. On the other hand, in practical terms, they had to accept a lot of EU regulations because otherwise they would have had many more difficulties in practical terms. Um, exchange um, of, of goods and uh, free mobility, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, 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 it's difficult, but um, you, know, you have to be prepared. It's not that easy and um, not to make too many promises to people that it will happen on next, next morning. It mm -hmm. not. Yeah, I think that is that is quite dangerous that the, the image is here, I think a little bit that, you know, that we'll be welcomed back with open arms. And I'm sure to some extent that's true. But as we have seen, even with, with leaving the EU, the yeah. EU, just, just, it's a block of rules. It's an administration yeah. and they will just apply yeah. the rules. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, even if, uh, I'm, I'm sure it would be much faster, but still. Mm. You know, you have to go through the steps of, of uh, a session because they look at, are you prepared to this year? So, you know, it, you have to, to, to show we are doing the right thing, but it takes time to show it. Um, yeah. And I think on the EU side, it's a lot less emotional. It's, it's not an emotional process. It's an administrative that's, that's process. That's right. That's, that's right. Yeah. And that's it. Yeah. Right. Meanwhile, emotions keep running very high <laughs> over here, and uh, and you know, um, hopefully, I mean, you know, the well, whatever the future brings, um, the UK society remains incredibly divided, and you know, with a possible Scottish exit, even more so. So, I was wondering if you had kind of to, to round us off um, some kind of concrete advice for for people like us who are very concerned about this issue and on what we can do 
to fix kind of the, the social damage that this has caused and to bridge this huge divide between believers and the remainers. Well, well you know, I, I think, um, you know, to keep up links that you have with, uh, with Europe, not um, to, to turn away um, and there are informal links that there can also be more formal links people like to come to Scotland uh, you know um, and you can have exchange programs uh, in an informal way um, and I would for instance I could imagine you set up a scheme as it happened after the war between Germany and France, you know, when they sent, this was way before we had a European Union, yeah? Um, the two countries decided, you know, we sent uh, kids from Germany to a French school and from French schools, we sent kids uh, to, to Germany. And, you know, you can start uh, doing this on a relatively small scale or you exchange teachers. Uh, so, and, and you build up familiarity with the other country, you build up links of friendship, you build up uh, common interests. So I would work on this informal level and trying to create as many links as you possibly can in the, in the cultural uh, sphere, in education, in, in research. Um, culture is, is, is a great glue, uh, you know, to bring people together and, um, and, and to work from there and, and politics, okay, eventually will, will follow. Yes, so I'm, and I'm hoping that I'm kind of seeing some of that, you know, as someone who is from Germany but has lived in the UK for all of her adult life, pretty much. I'm seeing a renewed interest in the rest of Europe from Brits, and I've been, I've been, I'm being asked a lot of questions a lot more than I used to be about mm -hmm. what it's like, what you can do there. I see more people wanting to go visit places in the rest of the EU and um, right. uh, so I'm hoping that, that sort of with all the Brexit mess something that has come out of it, it is, is an awareness in British society that maybe maybe we can't really go it alone as much as we thought we could and we should find out who, who our neighbours are rather than always looking you know across to the rest of the Anglophone world like the United States and, and Australia and so on. And, and keep looking towards the future Yeah, and, and get the young people on board because they are the ones who will shape the future. And I think they're very much on board because I think amongst all of the, the people who've been affected by Brexit is the young people who are now really starting to notice That's right. it's bite, <laughs> like, you, you know, you can't go on an Erasmus exchange anymore. There is a similar scheme now called the Turing scheme, but it's, it's not quite the same. And, <clears throat> you know. well, and also, if you think of it, you know, interrail, it yes, was such a great thing for uh, for you know eighteen years old to travel. You just uh, had one ticket. You could travel throughout Europe, sleep in the train, and you know yes. save money and to visit other young people. And uh, so something of this should uh, should be reinvented. Yeah. Hmm. And I think also what you said about social media, young people being much more connected internationally and much more at ease talking Absolutely. to other yeah. people. And I think they also see the reality of it more because they see that their friends in other countries may not see Brexit as this great liberation, but actually think it's kind of silly. <laughs> <laughs> so expose them, yes, yes. <laughs> Great. Um, so I'm not sure if we have any further questions from the audience, Denny. Um, I think you've more or less covered this question already. Um, it's how can we influence people who have that nostalgia for the past and make the future more attractive? Yeah, well, I, I think I've answered it. <laughs> Look towards the future. It has so much to offer. Yeah, I think that's yeah. a... A very lovely takeaway message and a positive takeaway message for, for us, especially. Thank you. Um, yes. Thank you. Lovely talking to you and all the best. And, um, you know, keep coming back to us and visit us. And, uh, <laughs> and we will come back and visit you. Yes. I'm sure we will. Thank you so much, Helga, for joining us tonight. It's been an absolute pleasure. And I do hope we've all, all taken something away from it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.